types of shows of impact. We're thrilled to have you on here. Everybody who's out there, just so you know, you are on with our special guest, Mike Delbeck. Hi. Mike, yeah, yeah, Mike is the head of the Responsibility, responsibility Project, project doing, doing amazing, amazing, incredible work. work. So Mike, I'm going to hear from you what you're doing out there and what the Responsibility Project is all about. Okay, the Responsibility Project is a comprehensive educational program on bystander intervention. So let me tell you what that is because that may not trigger a thing for, your, for anybody that's on the Hangout. It's a um, bystander behavior. Let's talk about that. It's any time that we as human beings see something that we know is wrong, we know is not right and just, uh, or maybe we hear somebody say something in an inappropriate comment or a joke, and we say, I should do something, I should say something, yet oftentimes we do not. Now, there are times that we do, but oftentimes we know that we want to do something or say something, but we don't. That is bystander behavior. And when we do intervene, when we're empowered enough to say something or do something, that's called bystander intervention. So that's what the Responsibility Project is designed to empower people to do. And uh, we started five years ago, and um, we started out of just one video. And now we've evolved into a project that has programs and services and products available to empower the individual. Uh, and again, not to tell the individual what to do, but to reach in and speak to the core authentic person that he or she is to empower them to do what they already want to do. Because a lot of times there's already something we want to do. We just get stopped. We get scared. And um, how can we get past that fear and take the actions in life that we want to take. And Mike, Mike who are you reaching? So are you working, I know you work at the universities, and for everybody watching, Mike and I are friends. So, so I know a lot of the answers, but I want to know that they're to know about you. So who are you reaching? Who are you helping? What resources are getting to people? Okay, great. So for the past five years, we, you know, where this program began, I'm always going to give credit to the higher education community, and more specifically, the National Fraternity and Sorority Community. There's 40 national fraternities and sororities that made this project possible. They funded it, they sponsored it, they spread the word about it, so I always want to give them credit. And um, so that's where we've spent most of our time in the past five years, and where I've spent most of my time, is with college students. But it started going not just in the fraternity and sorority communities on college campuses, but started branching out to the entire college community. And anytime you do that, you start, you know, you get, you start getting the ears and the eyes of adults that are maybe even working with the college community, maybe working with a particular organization, and you know, they want this message in their company or their organization because they're dealing with bullying or workplace harassment or a number of and a multitude of issues that we see in our common everyday lives, regardless of the age that we are or the different roles we play. So it's starting to branch out into what I call mainstream America, and I don't know if you have anybody internationally that watches this, but it's, it's a worldwide phenomenon. It's a human being phenomenon, regardless of how old you are, the roles you play in life, or where you live, we see things in life that are wrong. And Mike, and in fact, we love to share the journey that people took to get where they are. So I'm going to ask you to go backwards. And, and you were a, a, a film producer. I believe educational film producer for colleges and all. So can you, can you take us back to that? What kind of film are you seeing? What are you seeing? And what happened that went from that to where you are today? Awesome. Um, I, for the past 30 years, have produced films and video projects for the National Fraternity and Sorority Community exclusively. I never produced a film or video project outside that particular niche. Um, I was on staff for my national fraternity way back when. And... Um, you know, I started to meet the needs of the video production needs of other national organizations. So I did that for 25 to 30 years. And it would be like fundraising or promotional, sometimes issue driven. You know, I would, I, I, I had this idea in 1993 because I just produced a video on self esteem for a sorority. And I had the thought, I bet you that this sorority is not the only ones that deal with self esteem issues. I don't know. Call me crazy, but I bet <laughs> there are other groups, even men's groups, that deal with self-esteem issues. So I thought, why is this one group spending twenty-five, thirty, forty thousand dollars on a video project on an issue that is shared by other groups? So I thought, what about bringing groups together? 
having them fund a project for a fraction of what they would spend individually as an organization. And when we bring people together, we get a lot more money and can do a lot more things with that particular project, and everybody wins. So in 1993, I started the Greek Video Consortium. And um, up until 2007, had produced four projects, one on risk management, one on communication between the genders, the sexes, uh, binge drinking, and one on hazing. Uh, and those were the four projects. And then in 2007, I thought we should do another one. And uh, consensus was we needed to do another one, uh, another anti-hazing one. The last one we did was in 1995. So we started on that road, but it quickly, the more research I did, the more uh, I did some soul searching, I came across this phenomenon called bystander behavior. And to me, it stuck. It kind of like, whoa, we've never talked about that. And here's the deal that I want your viewers to know. I really got that we've thrown a lot of money and resources and time uh, to sending messages to perpetrators. You know, slap on the hand, fear tactics, whatever we could muster to say, don't do that. Don't haze. Don't abuse people. Don't do this. Don't drink too much. And we've never really put the equal, if not more, time and attention and resources on empowering those of us who don't do that, but we also don't stick up to those who do. What I call, I use the 80-20 principle. The, eight, the rest of us, the 80% of us, don't stick up to those who, the 20% who actually caused the problems. And that's kind of, you know, like, whoa, what if we did? What if we empowered the mass majority of us who are being bystanders to stand up to the perpetrators who think they're the majority, but they're not, but they think they are because we're letting them think they are. What if for once they got surrounded? And like, no, you're not going to do that anymore. We're not going to tolerate that anymore. What would that look like? I believe that that's our key to the kingdom, to getting rid of, at least diminishing or eradicating even, some of the problem behaviors that we see in our country, in our world today. So that's so awesome. Awesome. Like, because you're right. We, we need to be able to help. I mean, you and I both do this in our work, try to empower all these people to step in when they see something wrong or not. Yeah. How do you go from making that video uh, to suddenly having a mission? That was a personal mission to be your company and yeah, yeah, producing. producing. Yeah, I skipped over one critical uh, <laughs> step there. When I produced the, the video in 1997, thinking that it would be one the fifth project, and I would go on and do either individual organizational videos and maybe a couple of years do the sixth project. I just That's the way the cycle went. So I just thought that's what I would do. I would now, is it well, I started the Greek Video Consortium in 1993, but in 2007, I produced okay. responsibility. And thinking that would be the fifth, probably in a line of several videos, more videos we would do. Because, again, that's just how the cycle went. So I produced it. I released it, debuted it, uh, started going out to all the organizations that sponsored it, and they started using it in their organizational chapters and stuff. Then I started getting an influx of requests, emails and phone calls, saying, can you come talk to us about this? Have you written a book on this? What about a workbook? We want to put on a workshop. Can you come help us do that? Can you facilitate this? And I'm like, whoa! I've never, ever had that kind of reaction to any video that I, and film that I've ever produced. And I'm like, whoa, we've really struck a chord here. And another, this came a little late, because if I would have paid attention, I would have, the the sign would have already, or the, the shining light, the white, whatever, the spotlight would have already shown for me when double the amount of organizations, fraternities and sorties, signed on to this project that had ever signed on to any of the previous four. We'd had about 20 in the previous four. This one had 40 national organizations sponsor it. Wow. So I'm like, if I would have paid attention then, it wouldn't have been a surprise to me <laughs> that we're getting this demand because obviously this is something that people finally want to talk about. But the demand that started coming in validated all that, and I had to make a strategic business choice. Do I continue doing what I'm doing, or do I shift and meet this demand? Because I knew the demand was pretty big. And um, through some soul searching and everything, I decided I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make that shift. And I gave up video production and film, pro film production, being a filmmaker, put that aside. I have not produced another one since. And I focus totally now on meeting that demand of the public, of uh, providing whatever they need. I'm always asking, what do you need? You know, what, is, what would best meet your need 
that we can include in the responsibility project because it went from being a film, responsibility, to now being the responsibility project um, simply because of that demand. And Mike, are you the solo speaker, or are you looking to add on other speakers? I am looking. Um, uh, that's why I sent you an email the other day. I'm <laughs> looking at. Um, uh, I get such a demand, as probably you do too, but uh, to for middle school and high schools, um, and not necessarily demand from them yet, but a demand from parents wanting me to bring me to their middle school or high school. You know, and that's easy for them to say, but to actually have it happen is another deal because uh, it takes money. But I would love to create a structure to where I have an army out there of licensed um, speakers, facilitators, presenters, um, and maybe, you know, coined and trained for specific markets. Like, okay, here's my middle school speakers. Here's my high school speakers. You know, I pretty much have the college market. And, but, you know, I'm exploring a structure, a licensing type structure that can help, you know, because I'm only one person. It's going to take way more than me. It's going to take way more than you, and I know that's why you're doing it, to right, get this right. message out on a broader scale. Yeah, for yeah, all of what Mike's referring to is we have a K-12 licensing program, two-day program, about to launch an online version. And so people in middle school and high school can give our presentations in their local communities, and that's what Mike's referring to. It can do some powerful work. It's been a really enlightening chance. Mike, you and I will certainly be talking about that. Uh, Mike, what are the biggest things that you see? What keeps you motivated? What keeps you moving through this journey with the responsibility project? Well, we just recently launched an assessment uh, on our program, so I don't have all the data. We're um, ironically, not so ironically, doing this at Penn State University, and uh, to assess whether our training actually works. Whether it, you know, because it's easy to go anecdotally and you know go by the the stories that I hear and the text messages that I receive, you know, which I'll speak to, but, you know, that's one type of evidence, so to speak, but a lot of times that doesn't work as evidence for the people who are looking for evidence and data, so we are, we have launched an actual official assessment, but I don't have that data to share, but what I, what I personally go on, because I hate all that assessment stuff, all that data just makes me like roll my eyes in the head, but I know <laughs> people love it, people love it, they want it, so I'm going to provide it. But what gets me going is when I receive a text or an email through my website saying, you know, they tell me whatever they tell me, and then they, they end it with one of several things. First of all, I don't think I would have done that had you not come talk to me and, and had I not sat in your audience. I don't think I would have done that had you not given me the tools you gave me. And, you know, so my, my favorite story to tell recently is um, I had an email from a girl that went on spring break with her school or she was with her friend from school, and they were down at South Padre Island. The long story made very short, she walked into a bikini store, uh, kind of a tourist shop. They were selling swimsuits, and she saw that this guy was berating his girlfriend to where everybody in the store could hear it. Well, she intervened very effectively, and the next thing you know, she has a host of a TV show and some cameras coming up to her. Like She's like, what the heck? And it was John Quinones uh, from the show What Would You Do on ABC. And they asked her, they said, how did you know to do what you did? We never seen, because she took up for the victim. She, had, she asked everybody in the store, she goes, everybody, do you think this, she looks good in her bikini? She totally ignored the perpetrator. Right. And it was really effective and very powerful for that victim. And John Quinones said, how did you know to do what you did? We've never seen anything like that. And she goes, because I've been trained by the Responsibility Project. Awesome. Now, did that make it to TV? No! <laughs> but it was on the cutting room floor. But she and I, the show has confirmed to me that she said it. They just had to cut it for time. But, um, <laughs> but she says that, yeah, that I would have known what to do had you not, had I not come to your presentation. And so that, things like that, you know, you know, I could tell you other stories. But when I get stories like that that say, I heard your voice in my head, or I... I intervene because I was trained by you. There is no more gratification. There's no data or evidence, you know, statistically that can give me that kind of gratification. That's awesome. That's awesome. And for all of you right, right now, I understand we have a little bit of an echo for you in my hands. Mike, in the meantime, can you tell can people, you tell people what, what do you think are the keys to making an impact, creating a mission like you have? Uh, and we're not talking about, about a subject. We're talking about Oh, just 
whatever they see as their mission. Um, yep. you know, I think that's the first thing is you gotta you gotta pay attention to what grabs you. You have to listen to your um, your heart. And when something speaks to you, when you you know, I'll use the words that I used uh, just a few minutes ago. When you see that there's a demand for something you've done, and at whatever level you've done it, you're and it kind of takes you by surprise, like I did. Like, whoa, what, what? I've never had that kind of calls before. You, you know, just assess, like, is this something I can take and run with? And if so, how, do, how, how should that look? And you may not have all the answers, but you can start exploring and asking the people who are impacted by maybe what you did, say, you were obviously impacted by that. What else would you like to see? And then that's how you develop your products or your programs and you know, say, listen, I'd love for you to come talk to my entire school about this. Great, let's look at that. And then you have, <laughs> then it's on you to develop a keynote or whatever you want to develop, uh, like I did. I had never spoken. Um, I had spoken in front of groups before, but not at this scale, not be paid for it. And, um, of course, I was fearful. I was scared to death. I didn't think I could do it. I had a ton of reasons why not to. But I had those that supporters that that kind of lifted me, I guess you could say, or stood behind me and kind of took me under their wing and said, we believe in you and we believe you can do this. So you got to have those allies around you that will push you because your own demons in your head won't let you do it. And they'll come up with a lot of justifications and reasons not to. But if you can you know, find those that support you, believe in you, and um, just listen to them. Don't listen to that, what you're telling yourself. And what would be the first step you suggest for people? First step, well, the first step would be listen to your heart and kind of listen to the, whatever triggers you to feel passionate about something. And then, I'm certainly not an expert in this area, but I, um, I had to do some soul searching on, because at that time, um, while I was a filmmaker, I also had a full-time job. So I had to confront, you know, is this, you know, I, am I going to, is there enough here to give up? a full-time job with a full-time salary with full-time benefits and um, this is great because I have I don't talk about this much but I had I had enough standing where I was working that and they knew I just went and I had a talk with them and I don't know if this is where you want me to go is this good yeah this is good. okay okay because uh, I think a lot of people out there they find this but then they're working they're thinking how do I support myself support my family and still follow my passion you know, I went to them and said, this is what I want to do. And you can start doing it on the side. I started kind of doing it on the side, but I realized that I wanted to do a lot more. Who I was working for is a nonprofit organization. They said, we know that we could possibly lose you because you're so passionate about this, but can we work out something that would be a win-win? And they let me stay full-time, full-time benefits. We adjusted my salary a little bit, but they gave me the freedom and the space and the time to still travel and speak and spend time on something else that was important to me. Because they saw the win-win in this. They didn't want to lose me. But they knew they would if it was an all-or-nothing type of deal. And so I had that fortunate thing. Now, not everybody has that. Not everybody you know, has the kind of job that would be that flexible. And it may be that you just you know, you find yourself doing it on the side. Now, you have to make the decision, is this going to take away from my family time? Is this going to take away from other priorities I have? How much time am I willing to give to it? Because to really dig into something and create something that you, you have something to give to other people, whether it be a message or you have products and you know, all that stuff, it's going to take time. It takes work. It takes money. And uh, not as much money as it used to, thank God, because of technology, but um, it still takes some investment in several different areas. So you've got to make that decision. Uh, for me, I was single at the time. I didn't have a family, so I could spend other time on it. I'm somewhat of a workaholic, and that's a fault. But... Um, not everybody has that, and they have to make those kind of hard choices. Yeah, well, yeah, well we have incredible, incredible to to time. Time. What helped you, what go, helped so you go so fast? Oh, well, um, because for me, because I had spent so much time in this particular community, and in the business terms, I think it would be called a market. You know, the market knew me, but they knew me as a filmmaker. So... But I developed this amazing film that I had. You know, I say this. You know, when I speak to uh, talk to speakers, you know, how do I? Get, they're like, how do I get started? You know, 
I had a, for, you know, unfortunately not everyone had what I had, and I know you're probably going to hate me because you're, you're like, just like, oh, you got so lucky. But I had a product behind me, and I had a, a relationship with a particular community that it was easier for me to just launch. Uh, and for some people starting out clean, on a clean slate, they don't have that. Mm -hmm. And it takes a lot more work to establish your credibility, establish your relationship with a particular community or a market that, you know, because they have to trust you. Well, this particular community trusts me. Now, they knew me as a filmmaker. They didn't know me as a speaker. Fortunately, another thing in my favor, I got picked up by an agency that's very uh, well respected within the community called Campus Speak, which gave me a lot of credibility. So I was able to attach my name to something that gave me instant credibility that had people go, well, I've never known him as a speaker, but if he's with Campus Speak, he must be a good one. And I was able to get some business. So I had a product and an agency behind me that helped me, I think, go faster. But yeah, you had, you had, you had, had no writing. You had what? You had, you had, you had, you had celebrity status. status. Uh, you, in a particular market, yes. Right, right. Yes. Uh, and, uh, yes. Um, uh, I will, I'll, I'll, I'll own that. I did. And uh, I still do, which uh, helps a lot. You know, there's other markets as I now look at branching this um, out into the corporate market. I'm nothing. I mean, I'm not a celebrity. They don't know who I am, and they don't know the language I speak, because bystander behavior is not well known in the corporate world. It is in the academic world. But I'm now looking at positioning this message to be able to talk the talk of that particular market, so that the so that I can reach out to them and meet their needs. So that's what I'm in the process of doing now. But the other thing, too, that I think has to be mentioned is you just got to be willing to work your butt off. And yeah, I, mean, I, think that's I think that's key. You just got to. It takes a lot of work. You know, yes, a lot of things happen for me. By the way, your screen is frozen. I don't know what happened. Um, uh, just want to let you know. Uh, I, um, it, with everything good, that my celebrity status, everything that tended to work out for me, that did not all come by me just you know sitting back and thinking, oh, just bring it on, people. I've worked my you-know-what off, and I continue to. And uh, also, this is key, and I know you'll appreciate this, ongoingly train and develop yourself. Mm -hmm. Be a student. You know, as a good friend of ours that we both know and appreciate, Brendan Bouchard says, I'm a student first. Because I think we can get a big head, or we can get our ego too big, or we can get our aspiration to where we think, okay, I know what I need to know, I'm just going to go on and do it. No, always learn, always read, take seminars, do online education, train and develop yourself. I've, developed, I've invested a lot of money, and unfortunately I've had it, in my training and development, which has allowed me to go on and do bigger and better things than I would have ever known to do had I not invested that money. So I'm a huge proponent of training and development, and I think a lot of speakers, a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of cause-driven people don't invest that money. And if you don't have it, I get it. You don't have it. But there's things you can do online that are free, or you can get resources that are free, but you have to invest the time. And um, so I would highly encourage that. And I'm Mike, always Mike, looking. Mike, where can you find out about you? Well, two different ways. If you want to find out about the Responsibility Project, you can go to raproject.org. That is the overall project. You can certainly find out about me there in my keynote, so that can be a one-stop shop. But there's a certain aspect of that that I've also pulled out and created another website on me as this keynote speaker called mikedilbeck.com, uh, which is M-I-K-E-D as in David, I-L, B as in boy, E-C-K.com. And those two link to each other, so if you go to one, you can get you know link to the other easily. They're it's easily navigatable. But um, uh, but if you want to go to the project, that's raproject.org. Cool. Thanks, cool. Mike. Thanks, Mike. Everybody, check Everybody out Mike's check out Mike's fantastic, fantastic information. information. Thank, Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike. Thank you for having me.